to do a series of lectures here. I guess Al Brown is in Mexico, having a good time. Uh, I don't know if Al talked about me, so I'll just say one minute. I, I have a PhD law degree and bachelor's all from Arizona State. And I've been doing environmental consulting and research for before there was woolly mammoths, I think. So I've pretty much <laughs> seen everything I've probably done in probably 30 states and several countries, uh, hundreds of investigations. Now, this is not a uh, engineering class. It's a environmental management class, so I won't get really deep into some of this stuff. In fact, I'm going to tell you sometimes I get confused with some of these differential equations. So we won't, we'll try to keep off of that. But what I've been, been asked to talk about are aquifers. And uh, it's, if you're, if you're doing, uh, I don't know what happened to slides. Um, I didn't get them from, uh, so we're going to probably doing this longhand aquifers. And, you know, what are they? And why are they important for soil and groundwater um, contamination, which is what this, this um, class is? Essentially, when people screw up and uh, hire in people they shouldn't hire or managers they shouldn't hire and they put this stuff in the ground, usually the first thing it hits is the soil. And then uh, after a while, if you put it in with enough water and enough, enough time, it'll finally hit an aquifer. Uh, some of the more common contaminants that you'll see, like in Arizona, which I'll kind of focus on, is you'll see underground storage tanks from gasoline. Um, you'll see semiconductors, which used to be a real problem for both metals and um, organics. And, believe it or not, there's smaller things like plating shops where people will, will have chromium or lead. Uh, the other thing about aquifers is sometimes they're actually contaminated naturally. One of the worst things you come across in Arizona, if you're up in Cave Creek or, or, or some places in Ajo, arsenic is everywhere. It's in the aquifers. You can't even let the kids at the schools drink the water at, at the schools because of arsenic. So it's not always a situation where it's man-caused. And, and actually, in Arizona, your, aqua, your, your cleanup level for um, arsenic is 100 parts per million. And if I go outside right here and take an average desert soil, we're probably someplace between 8 and 12 parts per million. So many times, what you have to do is prove to a state agency that you're not contaminated. So you just keep sampling and keep sampling, hoping that you get a sample average that's below 10 parts per million to prove that you're not contaminated. It's, in fact, just the native soils. But aquifers are pretty much the receptacles of all this. If with enough water, enough time, they get down to it. Now, the interesting things about aquifers is most people think they understand aquifers. You know, they think, well, there's the ground surface here. And then at some point, uh, this is the equal pot potential mark. Most people put down this little triangle. What will happen is you'll hit an aquifer. And then the contamination will hit the aquifer. Well, not so much. If you're in most places in Arizona, you are not going to hit the main aquifer until you go through about two or three perched aquifers. And what these are are clay lenses that sit there. And in, I think in places in Casa Grande, I've gone through five perch zones before I ever hit the main aquifer. The perch zone is a nice thing because it protects the main aquifer from all the problems. But it does be, become a problem. Now, I know everybody is saying, well, for heaven's sakes, why are there so many pert zones? But what is a pert zone? You have to understand, when you have a drill rig and you're out there doing your investigation, you have a time machine. A drill rig is a time machine. So if you, uh, a few years ago, I had a friend, and he was doing an investigation, and he hit, hit a woolly mammoth skull at about 12 feet below ground. What does that mean? 10,000 years ago, we were at the end of an ice age. When you go down 40 or 50 feet, you may find out that you were right between two of the ice ages and what Arizona looked like then was maybe a, a bog. So where now you look at uh, desert silts and clays, all of a sudden 50,000 years ago or 35 feet below you, it was in fact a bog. That forms what we call an aquitard. So what these little perch zones will do, and sometimes they can be quite broad. They can be quite broad. Let me see if I can. Whoop. They can be quite broad. And what you have underneath it is a layer of clay, which this stuff will actually accumulate on. One of the problems is 
lot of people aren't very careful with these investigations and they drill through uh, the first doc, the first perched aquifer. And they drill through the second perched aquifer and they drill through the third perched aquifer and they get it all the way down to the, the main aquifer. So what was a small problem all bec becomes an immense problem. You should have never done it. Those little aquifers are almost like protecting you, almost like your skin. So that's a real problem with aquifers. Now, uh, once the water gets down to the aquifer, of course, now it's going to start to move. And once it starts to move, it's moving in a direction. And of course, everybody knows that stuff flows downhill. And that's what groundwater does. Essentially, it's flowing downhill. Now, what's interesting sometimes is some of these perch zones can be actually flowing in the opposite direction as the, the main aquifer. And the reason of it is, is that in, again in Arizona, a situation you have in Arizona, let me see if I can erase this, is that you have to think about, again, you have to think about when you go on a site or you're doing groundwater contamination, you have to think about what that site looked like 5,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago. And what you find is that maybe you're sitting here in a valley, like this is the mouth of the valley, and here comes the stream. And of course, 20,000 years ago, that stream could have been here. And 30,000 years ago, that stream could have been here. So what you have now is you actually have meandering streams that are underneath you. So you go down to investigate these crazy things, and you start putting some wells in. You start saying, hey, it's going that way. Then at 10 feet, it's going this way. And at 20 feet, it's going this way. And the reason of it is, is that it's not what you think it is oftentimes. Because depending upon the geology and where you were 20,000, 30,000 years ago, that's going to have a big impact. So that's just kind of a, just a, a, a thing about aqu uh, aquifers. The other thing I, I'm going to just do a little drawing of that makes aquifers interesting Geologists will always say, hey, you can see water go uphill under, underground. You go, how does water go uphill? They always give this little scenario where they have two streams and like a little hill and then another stream. And what they're saying is that rain will fall on this top hill. And there may be on this top hill, this could be many miles long, there may be some groundwater up there. Well, the groundwater now is going to discharge to the stream. So the groundwater will start to discharge to the stream. So this little water goes this way, and this little water goes this way, and this little water goes this way, and the same thing happens on the other side of the hill. The water is going into the stream, and then what they always want to do is they want to say the equal potential line, where these things have the same head, and we'll talk about head, where they all have the same head, this little flow line always intersects at 90 degrees. So what you find out is that when you're looking at the same amount of head on both sides, these things all intersect at 90 degrees. You get quite an interesting thing where the, ground, the groundwater actually looks like it's upwelling. And depending upon where you're putting a well, and if you're not careful, if where you put a well, you get all sorts of strange things going on. Seems like the wells aren't really, aren't really um, at the same levels. So if we, we look at uh, real fast at how these wells would look, and the common example that everyone, whoops, do I have the wrong pen? Help, I, have an, I need an intervention. Is this the, oh, there it is. Oh, I told you I went to Arizona State. Yeah, you can cycle to another page just by clicking an arrow so you can have another open Okay. Uh, so what happens is some interesting things with groundwater. If you actually have the surface here and you have a pump and it's pumping water out at some, at some, at some amount of uh, volume per, per unit time, and then you have some other wells here, here and here, what happens is that this well maybe goes down here and there may be lots of layers of different types of material. You could have a clay and then all of a sudden you could go into literally gravels and sands and then you could go back into a clay. So these could be gravels 
These could be clays, and these can be silts. And what happens is once this pump starts up, it starts to make what we call a cone of depression. It actually starts, the water starts to come to it, and the water can't come to it as fast as it's pumping. So what it does is it starts to dry up the aquifer. Well, if you have that series of wells right there, like this, notice these wells are gonna show water at different levels, right? This well is gonna show water at this level, and this well is gonna show water at this level. So depending upon where things are recharging and where stuff's being taken away, this thing starts to become very fast, a three-dimensional problem. Now, so let's say that you're out there doing a groundwater contamination study in Glendale, Arizona, and you think you know everything. And then all of a sudden, you know, the local farmer comes over and switches on his pump. Groundwater, which had been going to the Northwest, which you would predict with your great geology, all of a sudden groundwater turns around and goes to the Southeast. Not a very pleasant, idea when you're trying to put all your remediation and all your investigation to one direction and the groundwater turns around and moves in the other direction. It's very frustrating. But even more bizarre, even more bizarre than this is the situation where you have artesian conditions. And in that, it's really bizarre with groundwater. I'll just draw you a real fast thing. Let's say here's the ground surface. Here's basically a clay la layer. And then maybe here's your gravel. So your artesian conditions are that if there's a clay here and a clay here, and this is like a sand or a gravel, and the water now is confined. It's confined between those two clay layers. It's almost if that water is in a pipe. So, Let's say that that, that, clay, that that clay is there for miles and miles. That means where the water is recharging could be actually higher than your head. There is a bizarre thing. So what happens when you put a well in, whoops, you put a well in to that zone, the equal potential line, the equal potential line is wherever it's recharging, uphill. So what happens is the water comes into the well and starts to discharge. So it's an artesian well. And that's how those happen. But what's really bizarre now is let's say you have a couple of wells like little piezometer wells that are in that same, they're, they're, they're screened. In other words, what do I mean by a screened well? When you put a well in, it's just not a long tube with all in the bottom of it. No, no, no. It's a long tube, but there is actual grating on the side to let the water in. It's very important on well design. But here's the crazy thing, that if these two wells, their groundwater level is going to be right there, right at the equal potential line. So it's way up there. It could be 10 feet up above you. But once you turn this well on and let it have its start taking the water, it forms a, a cone of depression. But now the cone of depression is, in fact, you have to idealize it as the cone of depression now is up here. So this well is going to have water right here, and this one's going to have water right here. Now, you think this is crazy stuff? It is. You can go to Flagstaff. You can be by the railroad bridge there. I used to have a site there. And there's artesian wells sitting there. You can see them welling right up. Now you're working on a site and the groundwater supposedly is at 10 feet and you walk across the other side of the, the site and the water's coming literally out of the ground. How do you describe it as an aquifer? You walk 25 feet and at one place the groundwater is coming out of the ground and the next thing you're looking at it and it's down the bottom of a well. You try to explain those to state agencies. You will work your little hiney off trying to get those sites characterized. So these are not simple problems. These are not simple things. Very rarely do you go out and put a couple wells in, three wells in, and you're all done. The one place you actually can do it is Phoenix, Arizona. Because in Phoenix, you can, uh, if you're like on 7th Street, let's say Camelback, 
you're going to go through about 100 feet of silt, and then you're going to hit groundwater. If you're next to the ground, if you're next to the Salt River, you're going to go through 10 feet of salt, hit a bunch of rocks, and you're going to hit groundwater. Usually no pert zones, they're just moving in the direction they want to move. But what happens in Arizona every once in a while is the Salt River floods. Now there's a crazy thing. You can put all your wells in, you're all proud of yourself, and then the flood comes. All your wells were at 109 feet with screened intervals, so you can see the contamination come in. All of a sudden, your well's at 30 feet. And you don't know how many years it's going to be before they drop back down. And then everybody says to you in the state agencies, well, your wells aren't any good. Well, how do you predict that? And the fact is, you can't. The other thing, let's just talk about wells real fast, because they're fascinating in their cells is well design because that is how you explore the aquifer that's the that's your actual tool to get into it and usually what you'll do is you'll have your ground surface and then you have your your groundwater here and you'll put a well in to the groundwater maybe to the bottom whatever the bottom is at if you're in Phoenix, Arizona, there is no bottom. The aquifer in Phoenix, Arizona, I think, reaches 3,000 feet. It's all sand and gravel. There's more water in central Arizona in the aquifers than in Lake Michigan and I think Lake Superior combined. It's a heck of a lot of water. We're not running out of water any time. Economically viable water, where you can actually have enough pump lift to pump it out, that's a different question. But now you've got this well, and everybody says, how are you going to design that well? What are you looking for? They say, I'm looking for petroleum products from an underground storage tank. So here's an underground storage tank, and it leaked, and it hit the groundwater. Does anyone want to just take a little guess at what you got to worry about? About the gasoline that, or the diesel that's, that's hitting the groundwater? It's lighter than water. It's lighter than water. So, guess what happens if you drop a lot of it? Yeah, some of it goes in the groundwater, but most of it, for a while, will stay as a double layer. It's actually floating on the top of the groundwater. So now you put this well in, what do you have to do? Well, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality says that if you are doing stuff for underground storage tanks, you have to screen, in other words, make it so that the, the water can come in about 10 to 20 feet above whatever the static groundwater is, the historical one. Why are you doing that? Because you don't know where, if groundwater is going to rise or not. And if it does, where are the bad guys at? They're at the top. And they want to know how much that is. If you think this is funny, I was doing a little place one time out in the East Val West Valley. It was a feed and grain shop with a 500-gallon tank. It's just a little 500, but they had it there since 1935. So anyway, I'm drilling away, and I have a water well right there. I literally I have a water well at 120 feet. And I'm drilling away and drilling away. It's hot. It's, it's July. It's miserable. Nothing can make you happy when it's hot. You can drink water. You can sit in your car in the air conditioning. And no matter what you do as the geologist or the consultant, no matter how comfortable you think you are, you're uncomfortable, but the drillers are out there you know, drilling the well. So this driller comes over to me and says, Scott, it's getting wet. This is 85 feet, 85 feet. And I'm just looking at the, the static groundwater at 120 feet. I said, okay, I'm not thinking it's hot. He comes in about five feet later. I mean, he goes down five, it's getting real wet, Scott. And I went, okay, I wasn't thinking Maybe I had something in the car I shouldn't have been drinking. I don't know, but I wasn't thinking. Finally, at about 91 feet, he comes in and he kicks my car and said, Scott, it's wet. Oh, my God, it's a pert zone. It's a pert zone against the main zone. Even though I had a well and it was clean, I had hit this pert zone, or the driller had hit it. I was told about it. So I, I ran outside. We looked at it. We let it clear up for a while. I ran a tape down it, 14 feet of gasoline <laughs> from a 500-gallon tank that had been doing that since the 30s. 
So th these things can get pretty wild real fast. So you have to be thinking and you have to know what you're screening for. Now, if you're doing trichloroethylene, interesting thing about trichloroethylene is it's denser than water. The density, I think, of trichloroethylene is like 1.2 grams per uh, cubic centimeter or cubic mill milliliter. I mean milliliter. So what does that mean? It will actually go down. Why is that important? Motorola 52nd Street, one of the most famous super fun sites around. Well, I don't think it's a super fun site. So I was in the early 80s. I was a young guy and we were doing it. We went out in the back and we started to drill. And there was nothing. There was nothing going down with the water. And all of a sudden we hit the fissures of the mountain that was there. And TCE, we were literally pulling TCE in pure phase from the bottom of the well. So there, you actually have to do what? You have to worry about screening the bottom of the well, something you don't really worry about with hydrocarbons. So it becomes very fascinating, very fast how you do wells. Okay, so let's just kind of talk about some of the theoretical things about aquifers. Uh, the first thing is, What is an aquifer? Well, if we say that the static water le level is, that's where the water is exactly at, at equal to gravity. That's an interesting concept. It's equal to gravity. The pressure or the head is equal to gravity right there. What happens with water molecules and stuff that are below that? It's greater than gravity. Why? Because it's flowing. What happens in the zone between, which is called the Vedo zone or the unsaturated zone? You're in the area of the capillary action. The, the, the um, gravity is, the, the, uh, the head is less than, than uh, gravity. How do you know that? Everybody has done this experiment. And if you haven't, you can go home and do it tonight. Take a piece of toilet paper, take a, about this long, dip it in your toilet, and what happens immediately? Zip, it comes up, going against the force of gravity. That is, in fact, capillary action, and that happens a lot. And in fact, if you have an aquifer and you've got clays over the aquifer, that, that's, that capillary zone can be many feet deep. It seems a little weird, but you could have a well, you're stepping in mud, you're standing there completely in mud, and you look down, and the groundwater is six feet below you. Why? Because the rest is the soil is acting as the capillary action of the soil. Why is this so important? Because the capillary zone is one of the most fascinating zones. I have a big research project right now, and I'm a chemist, so I'm learning a lot about microbiology as I go along. But in that area, the bacteria go wild. Why are the bacteria going wild? Well, you think about it. Here's all these contaminants. They can be high energy, particularly petroleum products, um, benzenes, toluenes, all these things are pretty high energy. And what's coming down from the, from, the, the, from the sky or the atmosphere? Oxygen. Oxygen, and now you have some sort of uh, um, petroleum product. I'll just say, you know, it's a, just a total petroleum hydrocarbon. And so those things are sitting in the capillary zone and here's your friendly bacteria that are saying, wow, this is pretty neat. I got food and I got some place to get rid of my electron. The ultimate electron acceptor is, is oxygen. So they go to town and they're producing CO2 like it's going out of style. There are actually a lot of investigations where what they're doing is just investigating that CO2. And they can tell a lot about what's happening down there because of this capillary fringe and the bacteria that are going to town there. So it's very important for cleanups. You know, most of your cleanups, I'm going to say if you guys are actually trying to get into the environmental movement right now, if you're waiting for the big cleanups, they're gone. You know, it should have been in the 80s. It was ridiculous. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry had a spill. Every gas station used to have four gas stations on each corner and each guy was pointing to the other guy saying I didn't contaminate the groundwater you did usually it was all four of them but they used to argue that's why you have attorneys they never worked that 
the Arizona Department of Bioquality and these agencies are not dumb. They can figure that one out real fast. So, but what are you left with now in, in your career? You're left with the, the investigations that just can't be cleaned up. They can't be cleaned up. You know, so what are you doing? You see risk models. Everybody is trying to risk out of it. They're trying to show that, in fact, yes, there's contamination, but there's absolutely no exposure of the public to it. Leave us alone. But who's your best ally in this whole thing? The bacteria. The bacteria are working day and night trying to get rid of this stuff. So oftentimes, all people are trying to do is give them a little bit of help. Some of the times, they're just leaving it alone. They're, they're just walking away from it. And the agencies are letting them almost walk away from it, except for some monitoring, because you can't do anything. The microbes aren't doing better. So why throw them good money after bad? OK, so the capillary action, we'll just talk about that real fast in just some theory here. The capillary action, your, your equation for capillary action is pi r squared density, the, the acceleration of gravity, hc equals 2 pi r t cosine alpha. And what they're basically saying with this equation is that if you have a cylinder or a capillary tube, like a glass capillary tube, and you put in a bowl of water, and if it's a small enough capillary tube, you've probably all seen this, the water starts to go right up the capillary tube. Well, the water goes up the capillary tube until it finally quits. And usually when it quit, it'll have a meniscus. Gee whiz, I hate this. It'll have a meniscus. That meniscus, or that angle, is actually angle theta. The 2 pi r is actually because you're using a round, you're using a round tube. But notice what happens is that you got the acceleration of gravity and, and you also have, what did I do? You know, you wouldn't think I computed, did computer programming all day long, but I don't understand other people's programs. Just do not. I haven't even done it yet. I haven't gone past this. Okay. So what happens is when you rewrite the equation, you get H, which is over here, HC, which is equal to. 2 a t cosine the that this um, this angle of the meniscus over r the acceleration uh, density and the acceleration of gravity. The only thing that's important to know about this, you can almost forget it now. Everything depends upon r. The smaller the r, the higher it goes up. So since the higher it goes up, what you have then. What you have then is, is you have is uh, what your, your different capillary actions are. Really? It's me. It's me. My secretary <laughs> doesn't even let me talk, talk to two of the computers in the office. I think we're just a long time back. Oh, good. Not only am I dumb. See those three degrees at ASU, what gets you? It doesn't erase. He's trying up. It's not erasing. Oh, sorry, I exited out and then clicked keep, so you might have to go to the next page. Next page. All right. Yeah. So what you have then is if you have fine gravel, for instance, Your, your capillary rise is about 2.5 centimeters. But if you have silt or certain silts, your capillary rise is 200 centimeters. So that, from that equation, what you could see is that the silts and stuff, this stuff is going into it. That's really important where you're looking for contaminants and you've got to know where they are any type of the year. Because what's the strangest thing about groundwater is it will go up and down all the time. Well, when it goes up and down, if it goes up down pretty fast, it will actually leave the contaminants behind and actually pass it by. Now the contaminants come welling up later on. It's very bizarre. It happens. It's frustrating because you tell the Department of Environmental Quality, I think I cleaned up the site. Look, everything is clean. Look at my well. 
only to six months later come back and it's worse than it was. You have to be careful of these, these uh, capillary zones. Okay, so we'll go on to the next thing. When you talk about uh, groundwater and you talk about soil, one of the more important um, things is porosity. And what porosity is, is they, they have a symbol for porosity and we're gonna see a lot of these symbols. It looks like an omega symbol. And it is VI, which is the interstitial spaces divided by V, the total volume. What does that mean? It basically means if you got a box of rocks, <laughs> you got a box of rocks, a, 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 a cubic foot of rocks, there's porosity in there. In other words, there's open spaces. That's where groundwater can move. The fascinating thing about porosity is if I have a cubic foot of clay and I have a cubic foot of gravels, which one has more porosity? Which has more open space? Gravel. The clays. There's where it gets bizarre. There's more open space in the clays than in the gravels. And, or in, or, I mean, yeah, in the gravels. And it's, it's um, I've got a, I've got a, again, I used to have some slides and. Yeah. There's more space in it. Now that's bizarre in terms of this one thing. Once contamination gets into these, these clays and these silts, Cake thing. you can't get them out. They're just stuck. And that's why remediations are tough because most remediations depend upon trying to pump it out, use vapor extraction where you're trying to pull air through it or bubble air through it. These clays do not let you through, but they have in fact a lot of void space. And that's where everything starts to get upside down. And it's one of those things you can get it in, but you can't get it out. So um, when I, when I um, do this uh, porosity, I have a little porosity thing. But uh, right here, I'll just show you this, that when you're looking at porosity, I could just go to the next slide, right? That's easier. So if you're looking at porosity, and porosity is just the amount of void space or the interstitial space between the um, uh, between uh, the uh, what's the total volume and the interstitial space for soils, your porosity is almost from about 50 to 40 percent. Your porosity gravels. Your porosity is down at about 20%. That's quite interesting. So now let's talk about the next thing that you have to talk about. Now you know that there's two things that people will start talking about immediately, and that is specific yield. So what's specific yield? Specific yield is what the crazy stuff will give up with the force of gravity. And so what happens is with specific yield, what you're basically looking at is you take some, you take a cubic foot of, of water, uh, uh, saturated um, gravels or saturated um, muds or saturated soils, and then you let gravity drain them out. Guess which one gives the most amount of yield? The gravels. The clays are not giving much of a yield. Now, this is the problem why the United States started to run out of energy. Because the nice thing, funny thing about oil is it's the same thing. How much of the oil do you really recover when you get in an oil field? You think you get 100%? No way. The reason is most of the oil is adhering to the soils. Just like most water, if you would just make a, a, a cubic foot of of soil and you fill it full of water and let gravity drain out of it, you'll not get much out of it. You don't get much of the oil out. So what did they do? How do you think they improved it? Fracking. Injection of detergents. Why? Because it's a surfactant. What will it do? It will make the surface tension less and they can start getting it out. So when they started to do that plus fracking and something else, the oil field started to come back. 
but you're always fighting something with groundwater, contamination, oil extraction, you're always fighting the same thing. Something is being retained. You're not getting it all out. And guess where the contaminants are? Oftentimes the contaminants are sitting on the soil particles. They have a higher attraction for the soil particles than they in fact do for the water. Now you have this, this layer of water that's around the soil particles you can't get rid of. So now you've got a, you got a twofer. You can't get rid of the, you can't get rid of the, uh, the contamination because you can't get rid of the water if even you try to pump it all out. And they're sitting there absorbed onto the, to the, the surface of the, um, actually of the, of the clay particles. Very tough. Many times, a lot of these, a lot of these things just aren't going to be cleaned up in your in my lifetime. You're just, you're fighting against too many, you're, you're fighting against too many things. Okay. So I'm going to do one little, I'm going to do one little graphic that kind of puts this all together. And this is probably one of the more important graphics. I'll probably have to get Al to put this on. I'll have to make a, a copy of it. But this is, this is, um, percent water. This is the percent of water being held. And this is for clays. And this is for fine sands. This is for medium sand. And then maybe a coarse sand. And then the gravels. And what you find out is that porosity, the porosity as we talked before, goes down. So in fact, gravels have the least amount of porosity. But when you look at specific yield, how much is retained, you get quite a different thing. And then when you look at specific retention, you get another graph. And of course, these things all add up. So what it tells you is that where you're going to get the most amount of recovery from a formation. If you're outside of those things, it doesn't matter how much the state agency tells you to put in wells. It doesn't matter what you do. You're fighting physics and you're not going to make it. So as you could see, the clays are very tough. And what you have all over this country are sites, are, are oil companies, and you have lots of sites in which they have cleaned up what? The gravels and the coarse sands. No problem. You can get it out, even though it has lower porosity. The things with the high porosity have almost no ability to get the stuff out. And so what happens is you get to the place that, that you have some benzenes that are in a, let's say in a site in Flagstaff, Arizona, which I have one. It's in clays. I mean, you could take these clays and make the most beautiful pots. You could fire them. You could give them to your grandkids. You don't have grandkids. You, know, you give them to your nieces or your nephews. You can make it. And even when you fire it, I bet you there's some of that contaminants that are still in there. That's how, that's how these things get. So you're, you're, really in a, you're, you're really in a spot with um, soil and groundwater contamination as you start to move to those things. So, talked about that. So the, the most important thing um, we're going to talk about ne next is, is, oh, we should talk first about one more thing that people talk about. We talked about specific yield. We talked about porosity. Now let's talk about permeability. I'm not gonna talk much about it, but it's a term you should know. Permeability is, is just a property of, of actually, it's just a property of the solid support, the soil, the clay. It's used, but not very often. We're not gonna talk about it except to know there's a, there's a term called permeability that you'll probably never hear unless you go into engineering and you do some research. But what's all important in everything is the idea of hyd hyd I mean, hydraulic conductivity. 
Hydraulic conductivity is what 99% of every state agency wants to see from you when you start doing contamination studies. It's all important because it tells you about the movement of groundwater. So for instance, if you have, I'll just give you probably the most common thing, you may not see one in your career, you have a corner gas station. And uh, of course, you, the corner gas station is sitting on some corner. And the first thing you usually do when you find out you had a leak, you know, got to take the tanks out, you try to figure out what's going on. But the first thing you do is you go to drill some wells. Now, what your first wells are for, just show you how these investigations go, what your first wells for are what? You want to know two things. Is it in the groundwater? And if it's in the groundwater, which way is it going? So what do you think most people do? Well, they drill, let's say this is where the tanks were. They'll put in one boring. They'll go down, you have to get a permit from the Department of Water Resources. You go down, you get your drill rig, you're drilling, you're praying, no, 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 not the groundwater, not the groundwater. Of course, if you want to make a lot of money from your client, you don't like, like them, you're going, yeah, the groundwater, the groundwater, I'm going to make a million dollars. But theoretically, you should be hoping that it doesn't hit. You know, you're, you're supposed to be a nice guy. So you go down and boom, it's in the groundwater. Not only that, you install the well with the casing above, free product. Oh my goodness. Under federal law, once you have a release from an underground storage tank, how long do you have to do to report it? 24 hours. Ten, it's like a $10,000 fine per day violation if you don't do it. Has it ever been levied? No. Will they ever be levied? You would have to be some sort of jerk to a state agency to get that levied against you. And I, you know, I don't know how you could be that big of a jerk. I, I you know, maybe you could run for president of the United States. I don't know. But uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you know, but you don't get that. So once it's in the groundwater, the next question is, you, you have to tell this to the Department of Environmental Quality. They send you a thing that said, you better tell us everything you know in 10 days or 14 days, and you got to tell them everything you know. And then they give you a nice little letter and say, you got one year to define the contamination. So you run down the Department of Water Resources, you get your other permits, and usually what most people do is get two more permits. They're putting in two more wells. They think, based on groundwater maps, and you can go down the Department of Water Resources and you can get maps of the area, but also important is the Department of Water, um, the Department of Environmental Quality has an open file thing. So anybody in the neighborhood that had a leaking underground storage tank or a plating shop that leaked, you can go get their file. Why are you getting their file? You want to know, A, what the depth of groundwater is and what direction they thought it was. Because as soon as you think you know the direction, where would you put the other two wells? Downhill. So if you put one here, if you put one well here and one well here, guess what? You can triangulate. And that's what you do. Once those wells are in, you go and you measure them. And now I won't do the three point problem. We'll probably do that in the next class. But essentially, you know the depth, you know the distance because you have to get it all surveyed. And from that, you can tell which way it's flowing. Boom, it's flowing that way. Now the question of it is, and you know, if you're that one of those unlucky people that of course you find out it's going this way, let's say this is going to the southeast. You know, let's say it's going to the southeast. And oh my goodness, a daycare center. <laughs> Your worst nightmare. You know, what you really want to cross the street is a subway. An old gas station. That's what most subways used to be, old gas stations. You know it's contaminated. No one sits in there long enough to get cancer. But a daycare or a, an adult housing facility for the old folks, you're in trouble. So what do you think the next thing you have to do once you determine which way the groundwater is going? You have to determine how fast is it getting there? What's the speed of it? Now, if you're not lucky, if you're lucky, sometimes these two wells will be clean. You're done. If not, you're going to probably have to go across the street and repeat the whole process again to try to find the end of the plume. But the most important thing is 
you're going to have to figure out this hydraulic, what we call conductivity. It's all important because it tells you a lot about the movement of the water, it tells you a lot about the movement of the contaminant. So, how do you do that? Well, let's first talk about the main thing, which is this hydro, um, this, this um, hydrologic, uh, I mean, hydraulic conductivity. So, hydraulic conductivity is basically defined as a couple different things. I want to get my best equation out here. Um, hydrologic conductivity is, um, oops, sorry about that. By the way, um, is, is K, hydrologic conductivity is defined as K equals minus Q, divided by D, DH, DL. It looks, it looks <coughs> it, it, terrible. It's really quite simple. Q is got a, it, Q is actually composed of two terms, a big Q and basically area. The big Q is in fact nothing more than the volume per unit time. So if we're doing cubic feet, this is your rate. Cubic feet, let's say per minute. And of course your area is square feet. Okay, we pretty much have it all. What does this all mean? Well, let's make a little drawing experimentally of what you would be doing. If experimentally what you were doing in a laboratory, you would have like a, a reservoir of water, and then you would have a little pipe or a little tube would come out of it, and then you would have you would have coming into that some soil in a in an enclosed tube. You enclose enclose the whole tube, and then at the end of that, you'd have water dripping out into a pail of water. So you got water going through basically your, your solid material, your aquifer material, the stuff that you want to know something about um, hydroconductivity, and it's going through and it's dripping. What's the dripping? The dripping is, in fact, if you look at your equation, it's pretty obvious. There's only one thing that's there, volume per time, right? So it's Q. So there's Q, it's dripping. Now, You've got this thing raised up to some height. So there's your height, there's your DH. Your length is right there. The length of your crazy, um, your length of your crazy, uh, however your long your tube is. So there's your length. I won't make this an, in, I won't make this a differential. I'll just make this a, a regular. So there's your height, your length, and now, you got your cross-sectional area, which is on the bottom of that equation right here, is your cross-sectional area. What is this really saying to you? They want to know what is the amount of flow, the amount of flow per unit area. If you know that, you know hydrological conductivity. All it is is it's telling you it's a retardation factor almost like, that's not the correct thing, but it's telling you how fast this water can be transported through there. So that's how you figure out um, high, um, conductivity. So if I just do a, um, no, I don't think I'll do that quite yet, but that's, that's how, that's how the, the, the thought process goes. Well, as you would imagine, very rarely do you go down there to get some aquifer material, stick it in a tube, and do this. And why not? Because it's, it's not worth anything. It's worthless. Anybody that does it somehow got paid to, to come up with doo-doo. And the reason of it is, is if you have your corner gas station sitting on the street, and this is the groundwater right here, and the gasoline leak and the plume has come from the tank 
to the groundwater, and now the groundwater is moving it in this direction to, to wherever it's going, there may be lots of strata in here. There might be lots of strata in there. There could be a clay layer, a sand layer, there could be a silt layer, and, and usually that's what happens. How fast this thing goes is going to depend upon all those layers. In all actuality, where do you think most of the contamination is going to be going? If there's, if there's, a, if there's a silt, and then a sand, and then a gravel, followed by a silt, you know where most of the contamination is going to be going. It's going to be going with the gravel and the sand. So the most important thing about for the groundwater movement is to know where the sand and gravel is. But from the porosity, where's the contamination all at? In the clays. Uh-oh, there's a real problem. You're going to clean up the sands. You're going to do everything you can to clean up the sands. And what's going to happen after you pull all your remediation gear off and you walk away from it two years later? It's going to be contaminated because that stuff, where's the porosity? The clays. And that's what makes these very interesting. But so anyway, we get back on point, And the point is you have to figure out something about the hydrological conductivity. So what what people do, and I'm going to show you a small example of, is what people do is a what's called a pump test. And a pump test or an aquifer test is, is a way of trying to determine the, this hydrological conductivity. So if I erase this thing, what you do, it's pretty simple, but not. The interpretation is simple. The implementation of it or going out and doing is pretty easy. The interpretation can, can kill you. And even I don't do that. There are people that specialize in it. There are software companies. There are companies who have spent their whole life trying to de develop these models. But essentially what you're doing is you, put a, you take one of your wells and you put a pump on it. And then you usually have some observation wells. And then you start pumping. Now, understand something. You're pumping contaminated water. You don't know how much the city of Mesa and city of Tempe and city of Mesa, I mean Phoenix, love to have contaminated water coming out. What do you do with it? You think you could put it in a city sewer? Uh, not so much. So these pump tests can be very expensive, especially when you're removing thousands of gallons of water. That may cost you $2 a gallon to get rid of. So you might sometimes have to bring giant tanks on the site, have to set these giant tanks up, then you have to pump the water in the tanks, then the tanks have to be removed. It, it gets to be fun. So that's why you try to use whatever data you can from anybody in the neighborhood. So in our words, if it's a four, one of those, those, those corners that had four gas stations and one guy did hydrological conductivity very well, spent $30,000, go in the agency and say, can I just use the same number? Oftentimes, depending upon the day and whether they had a bad day or not, they often say, yeah, why not? Sometimes, oh, no, you got to do it yourself. But anyway, what happens is you start to pump this stuff. You're pumping it into a big thing. And what you do is you start to call, call a cone of depression. Lots of assumptions have to be made here. There's called leaky aquifer tests. There's called every other kind of test, a confined aquifer, a not confined aquifer. But in its simplistic form, what happens now is that the water starts to, fall, the water starts to come through this aquifer and starts to fall into this, this thing. Guess what you have created? You have created, remember with the little test with the tube? Remember the, the distance, the height, and the, and the length? You're trying to figure out this distance and some other distance, and you're trying to figure out that, in fact, that hydrological gradient. If you could figure out the hydrological gradient, then you can actually get to this, hydro, this hydrological gradient. If you know the hydrological gradient, you could say quite a bit about the site. So they have various ways of doing it, and the time is, is getting short. But what, what, let me. 
what you do with that is there's a there's a whole mess of equations, but what you you, you essentially have is I just think I'll do this. What you essentially have with a pump test then is that you take your data and you have equations, but what your your thing would look like, and if you actually have two wells out there, let's say this is your center well, and this is A, and of course that was producing a Q. Q, you remember, was volume time divided by time. This is your volume per unit time. If you have two wells out there, let's say like a B and like a C, now you've got to understand that Q, even though this is a radial thing, this is a radial thing, the Q that's falling in there at all these different levels, if they're all equal, so the Q here is equal, I mean the Q here is equal, and the Q here is equal, now you can actually create a, an equation. And so what the, usually the equation looks like is this minus Q equals minus the conductivity 2 pi r h dh dr. And again, if you notice what that is, it's that this is the volume per unit time being taken out. K, that's what you're trying to find, hydrological conductivity. 2 pi r h, why a 2 pi r h? Because this thing looks like, in fact, a series of cylinders. So you're going to be integrating, or yeah, you're going to be integrating these cylinders. And the dh dr, well, what's h? h is this height. And R is the distance from the from from the um, the uh, uh, the middle uh, where you're pumping. Beautiful thing about this is that it has the one thing I can always do in calculus. If you look at this equation, you can separate the variables. The one thing in calculus which is just great. Whenever I see it, I get excited. Uh, separation of variables. Oh, great, I can do this. I don't need to go to my calculus book. So you, you separate the variables, and what you finally get once you integrate over R and H is you get an equation that looks, you get an equation that looks like log R2 over log R1 minus 2 pi kq over h squared, the other h squared, those are the heights of those, those two um, heights in the wells, divided by 2. There's a bunch of, um, you can go to get away from log and go to natural, I mean go for away from natural log and go to log, and basically now k equals 2.3 oh, q log 10 r2 divided by r1 pi h square uh, h2 minus h1 squared okay we're almost there i know the people who are engineers and mathematicians are freaking out like what's he doing to me i thought he was with well, a management class just understand what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get this so we can figure out this K. Again, does anyone do it this way? Not really. This is a very old way they did in the 30s. There's all sorts of sophisticated um, software packages. People that do this now, most geologists don't even do this anymore. They, they just have, they buy the software package. Some old geologist goes out there and says, okay, now just pump on this kid. Then you put it in the computer software package, and it comes up with an answer. It used to be you had to think about it. The first one I did, I had to think about. But the beautiful thing about it is when you, when you go through the whole thing, those, if you remember, we had put it in log, log, plot. So if you go 10, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 on semi-log paper, 10 to the 4, and you look at, if you put your two wells out there, so they're exactly a logarithm apart, you know, plan that out. Don't just put them out there anywhere, but if they're exactly a logarithm apart and you plot the data, the beautiful thing of it is, is now you can get your S. You can get that difference in the height. 
And so I'm just going to do the final, final calculation here. And then you get on something like that, you get T minus 2.3. Um, let's say that you are pumping at 1,000 gallons a minute, which is not atypical. 1,000 gallons a minute times, you do this for three days, let's say, or one day, you get 1,440 minutes in a day. And then 2 pi, convert 7.48, which is your gallons to, to feet, uh, cubic feet. And then what the whole thing you were trying to do to get off of that graph, that log log graph, was the distance in the, in the, uh, the hydrologic gradient. Once you have the hydrologic gradient, which if you looked at that graph, you got minus 0.405, minus 0.65, you chug all that out, and now you get Twenty thousand seven hundred. Um, uh, this is in transmissivity. Twenty thousand square feet per day. That's an awful big number. But you have to understand exactly how they're getting the number and what they're using it for. But this isn't, con this isn't hydrological conductivity, it's transmissivity. And now I'm going to show you the difference, hopefully in the next slide. Hydrologic con conductivity, if you remember, was the per unit, per foot, the movement per unit, per unit um, pressure. But the transmissivity, and that's in, and that's going to be in feet for some time, like feet per day, but the transmissivity is they multiply it by the height of the aquifer, the height of the aquifer. So what this is, is K times B. And now this is uh, square feet per day. Transmissivity is a weird thing to think about. I mean, this transmissivity is a weird thing to think about. I used to look at it for years. People would say it to me, the hydrologists, the geologists would get all off on it. I would sit there and ponder that thing for, what in the heck are they talking about? They have this cubic thing and then they multiply it times the height. Really? Seems odd. But what you think about what's really going on here is you figure out what this hydrological uh, conductivity is, which is the amount of flow through basically a square foot. And then they multiply it times the height of the, of the aquifer. Let's get this. They multiply it times the height of the aquifer. So what you have to think about this thing as, this transmissivity almost, it's like this solid, it's like this solid piece of toast coming at you. That's what it really is. It's a solid piece of, it's a thin thing coming at you because it's only a foot square, but it's whatever height the aquifer is. Then what do they do with this number? Of course you could figure it out. They figure out how wide the aquifer is. If you know how wide the aquifer is and you know the depth of the aquifer, now you know how much water is coming through an aquifer. So from conductivity, they multiply it by the, the height, they get transmissivity, and then you can figure out by the, the width of your aquifer how much water is coming at you. Now, the interesting thing about that is, well, the interesting thing about that is that hydrological, what did I do? Hydrological conductivity is in feet per day. And everybody says, oh, feet per day, so it's coming at you that fast. No, it's not coming at you that fast. Of course it's not coming at you that fast. Because the, what you use for conductivity, it's a proportionality constant. So you have to multiply it always by the hydraulic gradient. So let me give you an example here. I think I have an example. Again, I used to have this all on slides, but Al and I didn't really think this out really well when he took off. And... 
like I said, you have to forgive me. I got kind of, you know, when they tell you you're gonna you're gonna do something uh, three months from now, you go yeah yeah yeah, and then they say it's two months from now, yeah yeah yeah, it's a month from now, yeah yeah. And they say you know it's tomorrow, and you go really, really, how'd that happen? It's kind of like your term paper. Really? Tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Are they kidding me? No, it's got to be a mistake. If you think that somehow you get older that that, that stuff is different than you, when you're in college, it's not. You know, you're, you're always just a day ahead of everybody. Um, so let's just look at something here that, that, that's kind of interesting, is that if your Q, again, Q, you remember, is your volume, time some time, like day. And then if you, let's say that your, um, your aquifer, I mean your, your, your transmissivity, and you remember the transmissivity that we talked about is in fact the conductivity the, uh, times the, the height or the height of your aquifer you're looking at, usually called B. And let's say that the transmissivity is, um, is uh, uh, Let's see, do I, got, do I got this all in the right thing? Yeah, uh, is 500 feet per day. And then let's say that your aquifer is actually a mile wide and a, and a whoops, excuse me, this is not right. This is just conductivity. So K is equal to 500 feet per day. And let's say that your aquifer is a mile wide, so that's 5,280 uh, feet. And if the aquifer is 100 feet thick, you know, that starts to look like a really big number. But now you have to put in your hydrological gradient. What if your hydrological gradient is only five feet in a mile? So now what you are multiplying all this by, let's. Let's take it down here. You're multiplying it five feet in 520. When you do that, what you find out is that this whole thing reduces to 250,000 cubic feet per day. You go, wow, that's a big number. But that's 100 feet by a mile. That's not a lot of water. It just seems like a lot of the hydro uh, the hydrological conductivity seems like a big number, but it's only for this small thing, and you're you're assuming all unit all unit um, dimensions. In reality, things are moving uh, things aren't moving as fast as you can. So then, well, I'm just going to end up with one thing. Everybody says, "Okay, that's how fast your groundwater's moving." Absolutely not. That's how much if you would if you would make that giant if you would make that giant thing 100 feet by a mile and you had a basket that's how much water would come out the end of the basket that's how much volume we would come out is it telling you anything about how fast anything is moving not really it's only telling you that that much water came out there what's the pro what's the problem with how fast things whoops I guess I ran out of. Sorry. I ran out of things, huh? I can just throw out a couple. Okay. More. We only got a minute. Okay. So, so that tells you how much water's coming out of that big thing, but it doesn't it take the count one important thing: the porosity. The porosity now needs to be taken into account for. And when you take into account the porosity, let me see if I've got that. If you take that same aquifer and you, you've, you've got that whole aquifer of the, um, so Q is equal, again, that's the volume per unit time, the average velocity, the area, and the porosity equals minus K A D H D L. Now when you when you do all that and you and you push everything through, yeah, you get this V is equal to five hundred 
feet per day times the hydrological gradient of five feet um, in, in, in 5,280 feet, if you're talking about miles, feet. But now you have to divide it by 0.2. Let's say that pro, your 0.2 is your porosity. When you think about it, what that means is that that water has to come through something. So if you're getting, if you think you're getting uh, a certain rate, when you put a whole bunch of stuff in it, it's got to be going faster. So in other words, if you took the 0.2 out, let's say, I think the calculation I did when we did all this is this V here becomes 4.9 uh, feet per day. So that's the velocity of the average particle. The average water molecule is moving 4.9 feet per day. What if there was no sand and gravel? It'd be moving five times as fast. I mean, it, excuse me, it'd be moving five times as slow. So it'd only be moving at about point, whatever that is. What's, it's only moving at about point 0.1. I think I did the math right. 0.1 feet per day. See, all the stuff around it, you have to push it through it, so it has to be going faster to get that, that same unit volume out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cake friction. Cake. It's, if you think you got it on the first pass, you're better than I did. I used to sit in meetings. People would be telling me this, and I was just wondering when happy hour was, to tell you the truth. So it's... it's uh, Essentially, what you have with groundwater is it's a lot more complicated than you think. It's just not putting wells in the ground and doing it. Um, the aquifers are very heterogeneous. You think you got something cleaned up. You think that you know where it's at. It may be in an upper aquifer. You could literally have two aquifers where someone literally drilled through it. it. It seems like the contamination is at one place and another place. Sometimes it's just how far you put down the pump you're actually pumping from the upper aquifer and not the lower aquifer. Strange things can happen. People will write PhD dissertations on some of these weird sites just to find out that no one put the wells in right. And these are people who have been doing it for years. Uh, it's not trivial. And, uh, and like I said, the nice thing about it is you folks probably won't have to do most of these sites. The sites that you're probably going to be working on are sites that are well characterized that they know exactly where the contamination is, they know exactly where the contamination is going, but they have no clue how they're going to clean it up or you're in my lifetime. My lifetime's a lot shorter, but your lifetime. So what are you going to have to do? You can't keep throwing good money after bad. That's why later on we'll talk about risk models and risk assessments. And that's the where your careers will probably be more into would be risk modeling. I'll leave you alone. I think we're done, right? Isn't it three, four, ten? Thank God. I think I'm out of stuff. <laughs> See, that was actually really interesting. Well, Thirty years, man. See, I got this. What's happy hour? Yeah, I got this. You know, I used to have.